Welcome, and thank you so much for joining this special guest lecture with NDSU alumni and distinguished entrepreneur Wade Myers. I'm Lucky Vidal, a senior at NDSU majoring in business administration and marketing and a Possibilities Fellow with the Center of Entrepreneurship and Family Business. I'm honored to serve as one of the student hosts for this presentation, and we are so grateful that you are joining us this afternoon for this exciting opportunity to learn about Wade Myers' entrepreneurial journey. And I'm Corey Wilmer, a senior at NDSU majoring in finance, and I am also a Possibility Fellow. Today's seminar is a webinar, so you guys are all in listen-only mode. We invite you to post questions through the Zoom Q&A function. You'll notice that there is an ability to upvote the questions. So if you see a question you definitely want Wade to address, please upload it. You can also connect with one another through the chat function. And after Wade's presentation, we will try to address as many questions as we can. We will be recording today's presentation, so please watch for the recording link after the session. And now, it's my honor to introduce Wade Myers. Wade Myers is a serial entrepreneur, investor, author, and speaker that has founded, invested in, and been a director of 100 plus startups and has completed scores of financing and M&A transactions. He is a general partner of the Eagle Venture Fund and multiple public equities and real estate funds. Wade's entrepreneurial ventures include a tech-enabled investment bank, a sauce-based big data company, a tech-enabled government services firm, and an Inc. 5000 sauce-based property management firm. He also worked at the Boston Consulting Group and Mobile Corporation and served as an airborne ranger in the United States Army where he was a decorated veteran of the Gulf War. Wade is a Baker Scholar graduate of Harvard's MBA program and an alumni of NDSU's Agricultural Economics program. With that, please welcome Wade Myers. Thank you very much, Corey and Lucky. I, I appreciate that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Megan, for, for setting all this up. So I'm gonna <clears throat> share some share my screen here and go through a few slides if everyone will allow. Let's see. Okay, got it. We ready to roll? Yes, okay. So first of all, uh, I'll take you back to my boyhood in the Badlands of Western North Dakota right outside of Medora, where it's kind of our one big tourist uh, destination, North Dakota, right? Our little cow-calf operation bordered the Teddy Roosevelt National Park, and we had some national grasslands that we leased. Um, it was a Mennonite background with a subsistence lifestyle, so we did not have any electricity, indoor plumbing, television, telephone, or anything, and we basically kind of lived off the land. We ate what we grew in the garden, and the animals that we raised, and we sold produce to the, the people in the, the nearby towns. And so very, very much like if you've ever been to a plain clothes community, that kind of lifestyle. My uh, mother sewed all of our clothes on treadle sewing machines. She tanned leather hides and made leather moccasins and shoes for us. And we just, we raised our own wheat, um, sit around the kitchen table and, and pick out any insects or, uh, ergot or anything else, and then we would grind it and, and uh, bake our own bread. We made cheeses, butter, just, I mean, literally, we made everything. When, uh, after my parents passed away, my siblings and I were going through their tax records, and while I was a boy in the 60s and 70s, in in most years, they only made a uh, 1000 or $2,000. So imagine growing up in the, <laughs> the rather harsh weather and harsh, horrible, uh, hard scrabble landscape of the uh, Badlands of North Dakota, and it was uh, it was fun. I I uh, real I for what I always wanted to make money. So my mother was very good. She's very entrepreneurial, and because if we ever wanted anything, she would encourage us to figure out how to make money to buy it. So I, I at nine years old, I would beg her to take me to Beach, North Dakota, right on the Montana border. It's a town of about 1,500, typical ag support community in North Dakota. And she would drop me off at one end of town, and I'd have some little sample kit or something, and I would go and work my way all the way down Main Street, all the way over to the where the new high school is now. And then she'd pick me up uh, at the end of the day. I made a lot of sympathy sales. You know, I, I sold I sold light bulbs. Um, I'd have a sample, a whole sample box of light bulbs of various sizes and types and, and take orders. 
and I sold greeting cards uh, I, and Christmas wreaths. I mean, almost anything you can imagine. And so that's kind of where I started my my lessons in in sales. Uh, and I'm sure, I mean, like I said, a lot of sympathy sales. I was pretty, uh, you know, kind of homespun and uh, aw shucks. I started working in construction at 12 at, at, at the after school in the sixth grade, would work two hours after school for 50 cents an hour. I was paid in four quarters and a can of pork and beans. <laughs> and I, um, it was it was it was fun. It's a fun experience. So the construction was mostly uh, roofing work, you know, getting up on on a roof, tearing off shingles. And, at, you know, as the winter set in and it get dark, the the uh, the guy I worked for would put up some lights for me so I could continue to rip off shingles. In the, at 15, I started working the night shift at the truck stop in Beach. It's, it was a Skelly's at the time. Now it's a Flying J. And I worked the midnight to eight shift. And they had uh, truckers rooms for sleeping and trucker showers. And I would shower in the trucker shower and, and run to school. And so, and I would go and after school, I'd go home and sleep on our little farm and then get up and go back to work at midnight again. It was, uh, I really enjoyed working and I really enjoyed making money and, and helping the family and and buying what was would, would have been considered luxuries at um I think yeah it was, it was sixth grade the reason I went to work in construction is I remember coming home one day from from school I I I went to a little country school with multiple grades per room uh, through the fifth grade and sixth grade I went to the county school with thirty three kids in my class and I got made fun of for my clothes. So I remember coming home and telling my mother, I want a pair of store-bought jeans. And she said, oh, you do, do you? Well, you can um, you can just make your own money for that. So uh, I, I worked for 50 cents an hour to buy a $5 pair of jeans. So that was that was my boyhood. I learned a, a lot of great lessons um, as, a, as a boy. And uh, let's go, uh, here we go, yeah. So then I ended up, so I was uh, I was welding after high school and had a welding job uh, in, in Alaska. And I was um, I was packing my vehicle to go to Alaska and I'd spent the summer working and um, my best friend from high school in Beach. So if you know about the map of Western North Dakota beaches on the Montana border is you come east, driving all the way to Fargo, um, Medora is maybe 20 miles east of Beach. And our ranch was right off of an interchange. So my best friend from school was um, from high school was on his way to NDSU. And he stopped at our ranch and I'm packing up my little pickup to drive to uh, Alaska for my welding job. And he said, hey, wait, my mom and dad want to know if you could just ride down to Fargo with me and kind of keep me company. They're worried about the seven hour drive. And then uh, we'll buy you a bus ticket back and then you can go to Alaska. Do you mind delaying your trip to Alaska by a few days? I said, sure, sounds good. And uh, so I grabbed a, a couple pieces of clothing, threw it in the bag, and I think I had 20 bucks in my pocket. So we're driving to Fargo, had a great time. We get there and my sister, who by the way, just spoke at NDSU two days ago. This is really, really funny. In that same week, two siblings. Um, she, was, she was at uh, Fargo and she was enrolled at NDSU in a nursing program. And so I crashed at her apartment in this married student housing right north of campus. And she was she was saying, you know, wait, I, I can't believe you're not going to go to college. And I was really excited about my welding job. And her husband was a welder at night. And she said, look, wait, you, you don't, you don't want to be a welder all your life. And I was like, no, no, it's $5 an hour. It's union pay. It's going to be great. And uh, so she said, you know, you could probably, school hasn't started yet, it starts next week, you could probably walk over there and just get enrolled. So she literally walked me over to Old Main. I stood in one line and and got a grant, got a, a check for a grant, like $600, stood in another line, signed it over for tuition. I think tuition was only $600 a year. And, um, I, and, and then she walked me over to another building, Series Hall, I think it was, and I just I just enrolled in some general courses. And she said, you can just stay, you know, in our our, our baby's room. You can kind of help babysit, you know, I'll uh, we'll, we'll just put you up for free. So I literally just was a walk on enrollment. That's why I say surprise enrollment. And then I immediately got a job uh, cooking at the Hector Airport. I was a breakfast and lunch cook. And I continued to work construction and uh, I was a heavy equipment operator primarily. And especially during the summers, during school, I worked for a Fisher Sand and Gravel out in the Dickinson area, but they sent me all over to drive heavy equipment, everything from a 20-ton um, 
huge gravel truck that I love, 16 speed, you know, two speed axle is amazing. And a uh, road grader, front end loader, um, you know, um, bulldozer, backhoe, literally everything they had. I was kind of a fill in for all over the country. And I was I joined the AGR fraternity and I washed dishes every single quarter except for the, my last quarter of my senior year. And so washing dishes meant I got free meals. And then um, I, in my freshman year, I interviewed for a campus activities job as a concert producer. And so I put on a bunch of concerts, really enjoyed that a lot. And then there was this big saddle and sirloin, you know, dance in the chips um, um, after the their big um, uh, stock show and the, 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 their country band bailed at the last minute. So, um, that someone contacted me and uh, next thing I knew I was a dance producer. So my between my sophomore year and my senior year, almost every single country dance on or around campus, I ended up putting on the dance and sometimes hiring, uh, you know, paying for the the hall or the venue, uh, paying for the band and trying to make some margins. So learn, learning to do some at risk stuff. I fell into computer programming. It's uh it was really funny. I took this wonderful Ag Econ class, and it was a ag, it was a simulation where you, we were, you know, the, there was farmers that would put in what kind of grain they wanted to produce, and based on pricing, you had some information. You kind of checked your box what you wanted to do, and there was uh, other students where you know like ran the grain elevator, and it was really a, a cool program where you would submit your answers. And then it would run through the computer in the next class, you'd come back and just big green bar report showing you how you did. And I, I loved the class. And right afterwards, the professor said, you know, would you like to come to work for me and run this computer program? And that was my, my sophomore year. So I started programming that computer and running those programs. And then I started doing more computer programming for the Ag Econ department. And, uh, and then um, I was also a teacher's assistant, another class that I took from Dr. David Cobia. It was a wonderful class on cooperatives, just loved the class. And so he hired me as a teacher's assistant. So I graded papers and worked for him for three years. And just, uh, and then I worked in the plant pathology lab and you know, all those greenhouses, I think they're, they're still there, but um, on the side of campus, there was all these greenhouses. I would go over there and Sometime during the day, I had to water plants and kind of take care of some plants and then ran a centrifuge with, uh, you know, kind of isolate barley virus for one of the uh, plant pathology professors that was doing a big project on barley virus. And then I joined ROTC. It was $100 a month. It was amazing to me. Like, wow, all I got to do is wear a uniform once a week and take a, take a class and I can uh, make $100 a month. I enlisted in the Army Reserve. It was called the Simultaneous Membership Program. So while I was in ROTC, I also enlisted in reserves and I got paid $79 for each weekend that I drove to Fergus Falls, Minnesota to uh, participate in the reserves. And that was a really fun time. It was a cold weather unit like attached to a mountain unit in Fort Richardson, Alaska. So we had skis, we had snowshoes. I mean, it was just, I was just like in hog heaven, had a great time. And um, so that was kind of my NDSU experience. The, um, I learned a few lessons and I'll, I'll talk about that here. Uh, one was negotiation. So when I was uh, brought on as a concert producer, <laughs> the very first concert I put on was um, a, a regional band that was super popular called the Mission Mountain Wood Band. They played all over the Midwest. And I forget what I paid for the act, but um, I, uh, I had helped produce the spring of my uh, freshman year. I helped produce Willie Nelson, Asleep at the Wheel, open for Willie Nelson. And we uh, and we also produce Foreigner and Little River Band opened for Foreigner. And these may be names that no, none of the younger set will understand or, or know probably. But um, and uh, I didn't I didn't pick up all the lessons I should have from this the senior that was handing off the job to me. So the fall of my sophomore year, I kick off this big concert and he happened to he was in grad school. So he happened to swing by while the concert was going on. And and uh, they the band had set up all this merchandise in in front of the field house, you know, in the um, entryway of the lobby there, and uh, and we're selling you know t-shirts and albums and all kinds of of uh, you know band merchandise, right? And he goes, oh wow, that's that's great. Wait, how, wh what percentage of the merch are you getting? And I'm going, what percentage of the merch? He goes, 
don't tell me you let them sell all that merchandise and you're not getting a cut of it for the school. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, I missed that one. So I learned how to negotiate with um, uh, the big talent agencies for the bands. And uh, it was it was just a ton of fun. And I had an office in the student union. I, I, just, I just thought, wow, I, I, I've made it. I learned a lot about scheduling. So in, in any day, I, I would go and work at three or four different locations. Um, and, and just, I was just trying, I had no money. So I was just trying to figure it out. Uh, I learned about mainframe technology. So most of what I did, did was punch cards. And then some, some terminals uh, came out towards the end of my NDSU career. Let me talk about a life hack. I'm, I'm not exactly proud of this, but it was what I needed to do. Um, I didn't attend very many classes. So what I, I was, I would sit in a class and go, man, this is an hour. And I would just fall asleep. I, I worked so much and didn't sleep a lot. And I, I would just fall asleep and I'd have no notes and my pencil or pen would just trail off. I'd be drooling on myself. And I'm like, what am I doing? And I would think I could be working right now and make another $5. And I got a, you know, a bill to pay the a house bill at the fraternity or tuition. And so what I learned is that if I went and bought a used book that was already highlighted and had margin notes and all that, that, that gave me an indication of what might be on the exam. So I, I would sign up for a class, go buy a used textbook that's all marked up, uh, the best one that I you know could find, right? I kind of look through the used textbooks, find one of the best notes. And then I'd, I'd go to class and get a, um, the, you know, they're, they're basically, they're, they're kind of class schedule at the uh, beginning of the class, like the first class. And then most classes in those days, in, uh, in most courses were, you had, you had a midterm exam and you had a final exam. And so I'd kind of look at the whole schedule for the class and if there was no quizzes or anything, just, okay, I, I know when to come back. I, I have to come back for the midterm and I have to come back for the final. And some classes were super engaging and I, I made sure I went to them. Like, you know, a number of the Ag Econ classes were really like that one simulation one was amazing. I just loved it. And that's what led to some of my more work assignments. But again, that left me less time to go to class. And it caught up with me my senior year, um, that last spring quarter, I did mostly independent study, I only had two classes. And so because I only had two classes, I got really brave and I actually uh, went to Washington DC and, and uh, was in, uh, I was active in reserves. And so I took, I, was, I trained in uh, Washington DC and then down in Fort Eustis, Virginia for weeks. And uh, wasn't even in Fargo at all, I was in Virginia. And I came back and uh, it was, there was a senior class. Oh, the, first of all, one of the classes was a, um, a communication, speech and communications class. It was how to write press releases. So I went to the professor on the first day and I told her, I'm going to be gone most of the quarter. And here's what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to sit, I'm going to meet my, our, our two senators from North Dakota, our one congressman. I'm going to sit through some sessions on Capitol Hill. Um, and I'm, you know, and then I'm going to be stationed in Southern Virginia, Fort Eustis, Virginia, going through some military training. How about if I just write a bunch of press releases about everything that I'm doing and then just bring them back at the end of the quarter? She said, oh, fabulous. Um, not a problem. Like I explained to her, sorry, but I, you know, I have some military training. And, uh, and then the other class, I went the first day and he gave the whole schedule and like 100% of the grade was the final exam. Fabulous. And so uh, I was only there that first day. And then I came back from Virginia in time to um, to take the final. And I had a really good friend in my fraternity. That, and he went to the library, bless his heart. I, you know, he would do this for me. He'd go to the library with a bunch of quarters and copy his notes. He took beautiful notes, really nice handwriting, handwriting. He never fell asleep. He had all the full notes. He'd copy notes. He goes, wait, let's sit down and let's cram together. And uh, so to this day, we get together and I just go, David, you, you saved me, man. And because uh, we took all the same classes, basically, he was also an egg econ. And um, so we crammed that night before the exam, we get in there. What I didn't know while I was gone the entire quarter was that he had, the professor had at one point started doing like, um, you know, taking roll. He kind of, so I get there and first of all, the seat that I occupied the very first day had already been taken. It's like, you know, people kind of settled into their seats and there wasn't room for me in the second row where we were all sitting. So I come in there in the second row with my my friends and, you know, we're kind of jostling around and it's like, everybody's like, well, what's going on? Why well, where are you taking my seat? But I kind of wedged myself in, had a seat. 
And the professor is kind of looking up and then looking down and looking up. And he, he gets to me, he goes, you're not in this class. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, no, what's your name? And I told him and he, and he, he kind of flipped and he kind of like at the very end and he goes, you've never been to class. And I said, um, I, I, well, I'm here now for the exam. He said, you see me after class. And I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. I took it too far. You know, I shouldn't have moved to Virginia. Anyway, and uh, so after the exam, he marches me down the hall to, in the corner, there was the Dean of Agriculture's Moral Hall. And there's also a Department of Ag Econ. And he marches me in there. And I forget the lady's name, but she was like the secretary for the Department of Econ, Ag Econ. And she looks up and she goes, hi, Wade. And he goes, do you know this kid? She goes, yeah, he programs our computers. <laughs> he was like, he was mad and he, he took me into the, the head of the, the department head of Ag Econ and he knew me as well. And I felt so bad, like, I and, and he was saying, how come you've never been to class? I said, I'm sorry, but I was stationed active duty in Virginia. And uh, he said, well, let's just see how you fare on the exam. And I, I ended up acing the exam. So one thing I'm good at is memorizing and regurgitating. And, but I, I I really felt bad, but the uh, it was kind of a, a little bit of a laugh for the Ag Econ department because most of the professors knew me, this one didn't, and just you know didn't know that I I worked for the department. Um, but I did learn a lot about at risk ventures and had a had a blast. What I did was after I graduated, I had the Ag Econ department said, "Hey, can you come back and get your master's, um, and we'll pay we'll we'll, we'll give you a, a a teaching assistantship. You teach a class." And it will waive your tuition, we'll pay you a monthly stipend. So I thought, okay, wow. I was in ROTC, I'd already been commissioned, but I got an educational delay. And so you know, I spent that summer working in construction and um, basically, you know, rented equipment and, you know, bid a, a big construction job and was uh, put in all the roads and sewer and water and whatnot, trenched everything into a 550 um, unit housing project in Williston. It was during the oil boom. And, and meanwhile, I interviewed all these ranchers to collect all my data for my master's thesis. And then when I came back, I did one quarter in the fall, and then my educational delay got canceled. It was a Reagan buildup. And so I was called to active duty and won an active duty. And so uh, that was my, um, it was a Reagan era buildup. Uh, I graduated in 81. Uh, Reagan got a, elected the fall of 80. And so he was building up the military and kind of like unlimited budget. And I, I had an absolute blast. I had so much fun in the military. First of all, this was this three years from, I went in January 82 after my education delay got canceled. And so I got out in January of 85, those three years, they were peacetime years, but it was the cold war and we, we had a, a big budget. And so we could do kind of a whole bunch of stuff. And I just, I just trained and trained and volunteered for training and uh, really went deep into atomic demolitions, nuclear uh, explosives, liquid explosives, slurry explosives, et cetera. When I, when I got to my posting in Fort Hood, Texas, in Central Texas, my commander of this special weapons unit said, Wade, you need to have a master's. If you're going to you know, be in the Army, you got to have a master's degree. And so Texas A&M had a satellite campus there. And I enrolled in grad school. And they, they accepted all the credits from NDSU. And this program was kind of a computer science, computer information systems program. So while I was in the army, I, I completed my graduate degree. And so what I what I learned about the military, a couple of things. One, it was easier to get forgiveness and permission. There was a whole bunch of situations where I would just, um, like for example, I, I graduated at the top of my officer basic course and I got to choose one school. And so a um, well-informed friend of mine, another you know, officer or colleague said, Wade, choose Ranger because you, you, otherwise you'll never get it. And then they have to send you to airborne school, right? Because uh, what good is a Ranger if you can't parachute? So, so I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through Ranger training, and I had orders to go right to Fort Hood to, you know, to, um, to uh, start my, my um, assignment. And... Um, I uh, I thought, well, you know, as long as I'm here at Fort Benning where the Airborne School is, I'm going to go over there and see if I can walk on. After all, I walked on to NDSU. I, you know, did a, a you know, kind of done this before. And so I go to the Airborne School and I go, uh, I'm supposed to check in when's your next class. And they go, where's your orders? 
And I go, oh, you don't have my orders? Um, uh, can we call a mill person? That's a military personnel center. So we call a mill person and they go, uh, get on my, when my assignments officer gets on, he goes, what are you doing, Myers? You, you, you're supposed to be at Fort Hood. I said, well, I, I thought as long as I was here, he goes, okay, okay. I'll cut some orders and, but you know, as soon as you're not with Airborne, you, you need to get on. Um, when I was, um, after my officer basic course, I had a whole month before Ranger School started. And my sister was stationed in the Air Force, also an NDSU grad, um, and she was in Washington, DC. She had these brunches. And so while I'm waiting for Ranger training, uh, I meet this major at this brunch and he goes, oh, what are you doing during your kind of month of downtime? I said, oh, they got me uh, editing some manuals. It's boring as I'll get out. He goes, oh, I have this nuclear weapons school. You should show up. So same thing, you know, so I just, I learned that, man, as long as I just showed up and volunteered, chances are I could, I could, uh, you know, um, join, join the training or uh, change my assignment, et cetera. So during my month of downtime, I became an atomic demolitions uh, expert, got nuclear weapons certified, got my uh, top secret background investigation. It had all this stuff going on. So by the time I finished airborne training at Fort Benning and got to Fort Hood, I was supposed to go to like just a regular unit. And this, this major that I ended up working for that talked me to the master's program, he he sees me and he grabs you know the, the my military records jack and he goes, what? You're atomic demolitions trained and certified and you're nuclear weapons certified. And I've got seven officers in my atomic demolitions unit. Nobody can get that training. How'd you get that training? <laughs> so he grabbed me, goes, you're not working for me. And I'm going, okay, but my orders say this. He goes, doesn't matter. I'm going to trade you for two other lieutenants. And so I just kind of fell into these situations in the Army. I just absolutely loved it. What I did come to find out, though, because I wasn't West Point, back in those days, West Point grads got all the uh, everything, right? Uh, ROTC kind of got the crumbs. And so I thought, oh, wow, OK, I, I get it. I, if there's another opportunity for me to have a branding uh, opportunity, I'm going to take it and not miss out on that. Um, Obviously, with all the training, you know, special operations training, developing mental and physical toughness, I learned how to lead. Oh, boy, that's uh, the military is just the best way to gain leadership experience. And during my master's program with Texas a and I learned about mid-range computers, PCs, and Macs. I bought a Mac right after the ad uh, at the, in the 1984, the Olympics ad, where the, the woman's running down and throws the hammer at Big Brother, the screen of Big Brother. And I really enjoyed serving my country. It was, it was wonderful. I got out after three years and was recruited to mobile and held several positions at mobile, including the national level position was uh, managing a $150 million business unit. Now that all sounds really good. And my friends were really impressed until I, you know, had to maybe admit what I, what I sold. It wasn't nearly as exciting or thrilling as it might've been. I'll bring that up in a second. Uh, so the lessons learned at mobile, Fortune 500 company, um, seven years, uh, a lot of rivalry, competing for promotions. You know, there's a lot of people at the same level and we are all like, who's going to get promoted? Who gets that job? You know, um, I learned the importance of customer focus versus manufacturing focus. We made some real mistakes uh, corporate wide in my uh, the division I worked for. I worked for a two billion dollar division and uh, it was I had a bird's eye view at corporate headquarters. Uh, to see all these other division managers. So I ran one division. We had several divisions and the whole thing was like under a $2 billion business unit. And I, I learned a lot, uh, especially about the importance of strategy. We had no, no division um, had ever done a five-year strategy plan. So I did, I did one for my, my business unit. And uh, I, I also learned uh, the importance of staying lean and flexible because we had a hard time. We we always, I worked in a, in a manufacturing part of mobile and we always gold plated everything. We had a very, very expensive um, cost of goods sold and direct labor because of the way we operated. And we had small, flexible and lean competitors that could come in way below us on pricing. It was really interesting. So I, I, I loved my time there. I, I kept moving around. I got promoted you know, every, every uh, 12 to 15 months. It was, uh, it was a, a great deal of fun, but the Gulf War happened in 91. And so I got recalled to active duty for the Gulf War, which was actually a nice break from the corporate world. So um, I had been in the Army Reserve during those seven years at Mobile. 
And um, and then so um, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and I was told, hey, our, to our unit, you know, we're on alert, get ready, pack your stuff, right? Then we're off alert, on alert, off alert. And it was kind of frustrating. And one day I was just doing a weekend drill down at Presidio San Francisco and there was a language annex where I was working. And up on this big shelf is all these uh, languages. And one was uh, beginner's Arabic. And it had a bunch of cassette tapes. That was the format, you know, back then. And workbooks. And it's like, oh. So I grabbed that thinking, hey, if I get called up, that'll come in pretty handy. Threw it in my briefcase. And I was checking out at the end of the weekend with the personnel sergeant. And um, and I was kind of, you know, just so frustrated because we were, we kept sending soldiers over there. And, and this was uh, early January. We hadn't started the ground or the air war yet. And uh, but we were had been sending soldiers for like four or five months and building up six hundred thousand soldiers. I'm like, Sergeant, you know, why why aren't I? You know, I'll go as an individual. You know, forget the whole unit being mobilized. I'll just I'll just go as an individual. And he goes, Yeah, Captain Myers, man, you got you know tons of experience and all the training you've had. And yeah, I, th I think you'd be a um, have a good chance of being called up as an individual um, as opposed to the whole unit, which you can do. You can just say I'll be an individual to go. And I said, well, you do know that I speak Arabic, right? And I and and I said, well, I, I'm learning because I'm thinking about this, you know, beginner's Arabic in my briefcase. Like, hey, I, I, I'm I'm learn I'm about to learn, and uh, kind of mumbled that. Um, and he goes, you speak Arabic? I said, well, I'm, I'm I'm learning, you know. And he goes, I think that I don't think we knew that, you know, that might change everything. And so um, that was Sunday. At the end of the day, on Tuesday. I'm in Phoenix working with uh, one of my employees in Phoenix. And uh, I get this call from my secretary and she said, are you Captain Myers by any chance? And I go, yeah, yeah, it's uh, my reserve role. And she said, there's some sergeant so-and-so, he really wants you to call him. So I call him and he goes, it's that personnel sergeant. He goes, Captain Myers, you, you, you have to report Friday to Fort Sheridan, Illinois. You're, you're being sent over as an Arab liaison officer. I'm like, all right, you know, it's kind of this, okay, I, I get to go, but oh man. And so uh, I strapped into the C-141, the little web job seat in Milwaukee uh, after in processing in Fort Sheridan, Illinois, and then flew all the way over, did all these hops, you know, to the East Coast, New Brunswick, London, Germany, et cetera, finally get into Saudi Arabia. And meanwhile, the whole time I'm on a, my little Sony Walkman listening to, uh, you know, beginner's Arabic and, and trying to trying to mimic that and how to say the greeting of the day and, you know, salam alaikum, kifalak al yom, et cetera. And so there, um, and then when I got there, I was rushed to the front because I spoke the language, of course, and uh, um, and was an Arab liaison officer and had a wonderful experience. Um, it was really, really uh, incredible. And um, it was a nice break from from the corporate world. And it gave me a real chance to kind of clear my head. So uh, one, one of the lessons learned is kind of fake it till you make it, if you will, in the Arabic thing. I'm not too proud of that. You know, I, I really sort of exaggerated my capability. I certainly did, but I, I did make good on it. I mean, by the, you know, within those four or five days before I actually, uh, maybe it was a week almost, before I landed in uh, Riyadh, um, I, I learned a number of phrases and I kept learning the entire time I was there. I was there for several months. And just even trying to speak Arabic with all of my um, Arab civilians and officials and military officers and dignitaries endeared me to them, and they would help me along. And you know, and I, and I hired a, I hired a translator. There was a, a Lebanese officer, American Army officer, but he had grown up in, in Lebanon into his adulthood. He came to America and joined the military. And so I grabbed him and said, you now work for me. And, uh, and he was wonderful. He would do all the written contracts for me because I would, I would negotiate contracts and so forth. And he, would, he was my language coach. Um, it was what I would say about the Gulf War in 91, uh, way different than the war on terror that we've been through recently, is that it was, uh, we, 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 did it, we did it right. We were there to free Kuwait. And we had a whole coalition of, um, you know, Hundred or more countries with us, and um, and we uh, it was overwhelming force. Everything went well. So and we got you know scudded and scud missiles would blow up you know near me and we'd put on the gas mask and jump into the you know a sandbagged you know bunker and all that. 
but it was just enough uh, danger and thrill. Um, but also I, I was able to play a role at a headquarters level and liaise with, you know, um, Saudi generals and, and so forth. So it was really interesting. And I went on some diplomatic missions because all the, all the senior American officials assumed that I was fluent. I could actually speak entire phrases and handle quite a bit of business all in Arabic with, you know, kind of mimicking a classic uh, 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 Arabic accent, like the accent of the mosque. And, um, and it really fooled American officers. So they'd come and grab me, you're that ranger that speaks the language, you know, and, and take me on these diplomatic missions. And it was really, I just loved it. It was so much fun. I traveled all over the, you know, the Middle East on on missions like that. And and it was that desert experience that where I kind of thought, you know, I don't really enjoy what I'm doing at mobile and the corporate world. I really want to be an entrepreneur. I had done a lot of entrepreneurial things as a boy and at NDSU, and I just wanted to kind of get back to that. But I'd spent all, you know, all this time in, in the army, three years, seven years at mobile. And so I'm over there in the desert going, you know, when I get back, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to buy a company and run it, or I want to start a company and run it, but I don't. I don't really know how to do that. Uh, I studied ag econ at NDSU, but as you've heard, didn't take a lot of classes. I learned a lot of other great lessons, <laughs> um, but uh, and, but I just, I wanted to learn. So I thought um, when I come back, maybe I'll, um, you know, try to go to grad school again. And so when I, uh, there was, uh, I didn't have time to study for the GMAT. And I got, I mailed off little postcards and got all kinds of applications for a bunch of business schools. And that there was only two years in Harvard Business School history that they did not require the GMAT. And I had no time to study the night before the GMAT exam. I realized that I can't take it. I'll, I'll bomb it and it'll look bad. And so uh, I only applied to Harvard Business School. And so I was blessed with the opportunity to go there to your full-time program, moved to Boston. And during the first week or two, these are the kind of questions that that you would get. Everybody was asking everybody else the questions. You know, you're kind of you know going through orientation and getting to meet everybody. And in most cases, the person asking the question couldn't wait to tell you their answer, right? And uh, there was a lot of pride in where people had gone undergraduate and what they did before school. So they'd say, "Where did you work before HBS?" And uh, and I would tell them I sold garbage bags because my role. I promise you, I'd tell you at Mobile Chemical was I was in the plastics packaging division, it's $2 billion division, and he we had hefty trash bags, we had styrofoam meat trays, all kinds of bags and meat trays and styrofoam stuff, right? It, like I said, it wasn't very exciting, uh, but I would just, you know, rather than participate in the game of trying to one-up somebody, I would just say, I sold garbage bags. No, no, really. What'd you do? Yeah, I, I, I sold garbage bags for uh, the plastics division of mobile. And uh, that was decidedly unimpressive, but I had fun with it. You know, it's like I'm older than the average student by about six years uh, because of the additional work experience that I had. I was just happy to be there. And then the next question would be, where'd you do your undergrad? And at the time, uh, North Dakota only had two universities, UND and NDSU, Dickinson, Minot, et cetera, weren't uh, there still were colleges and not at university status. And so my answer would be, I went to one of the top two schools in North Dakota. And it kind of paused and say, there's only two universities in North Dakota. <laughs> and again, they'd kind of look at me and then I'd get, I'd get a number of guys or gals that would say, aren't you a little old to be an MBA student? And my answer is just, yeah, but if you only knew how um, far I've come and how far behind you I started, uh, you'd understand why it took me six additional years to land here. Now, what I will admit, even though I was 33 years old when I enrolled, most of the average was like 26 or 27. Um, the the students that had worked in consulting, like with BCG or McKinsey, or had worked on Wall Street, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, were very intimidating, even though they maybe were only 26 years old. They had a, a lexicon and uh, oh, a manner of talking. They had a lot of cross industry experience where they worked with a lot of clients in a lot of different industries. I only knew two things. I knew the army and I knew plastics packaging. And so it was, wow. I thought, man, this is, uh, this is humbling to have all these students several years younger. Um, but what I came to realize is that most had been individual contributors. They hadn't led people, they hadn't managed people and they didn't have the life experience that I did. 
And so it turned out to be a great experience because when grades first came back, I realized that, oh, I'm actually doing you know quite well. I would say I had a lot of speech and um, uh, communications training. I minored in that in, in DSU because I just loved it. Um, and uh, I was able to organize my thoughts fairly well. So I ended up doing well there. But here's, here's a couple of lessons that I learned. Um, what I told myself is now I did work. I worked as a consultant uh, part-time, but I, I didn't miss any class except for when I got snowed into New York one time, one weekend and missed, missed classes on Monday. But I thought, okay, if I'm gonna do this, first of all, the brand matter. I missed out on branding with West Point and the army, right? So I thought if I'm gonna do this, I want I want a, you know, a great uh, MBA program. And I want, I'm going to attend classes. I'm going to pay attention. <laughs> so I'm here to learn. Um, but what I, what I learned is kind of like understanding what's required or expected. So I'd, I'd look again when they handed out the course materials and look at all the cases that we were assigned. They gave us a whole bundle of cases, right? And it'd be in the, the, cla the classes and the cases would be sort of grouped by topic. And so I knew that, you know, if it was a marketing class, a 30 case class, and the, the topic was uh, sales management. I knew to, when I read the case, to look for issues of sales management, right? If it was a pricing case. And so I would kind of look at that and, and know then how to, how to you know, read the case, if you will. So I kind of studied the process and, and looked for patterns and hacks. And I, de I developed this framework where how I read the case, I'd read through really quickly, make a few notes and kind of come up with my hypothesis of, okay, there's three or four things going on here. And then being efficient, I would then only drill into those, you know, deep into those exhibits. Because in most cases, it's like 15 or 20 pages of written content and then 15 or 20 or even 30 exhibits. And some of my poor classmates would read the case two or three times and then analyze every single exhibit and spend all this time crunching every single number and just spent hours per case preparing, I got it down to 20 minutes of preparation from opening the case to walking into class, just 20 minutes each case because of the efficiency of kind of this hack that I uh, kind of figured out. And then um, and I kept all my margin notes in every case that I took notes during the, 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 the discussion and then structured all that for exams and, and was ready to write an exam. Exam was a four hour exam where you, you got, you know, handed a case, you had four hours to read it and, and write in a full analysis of the case. And so one of the things I learned is that most of the students jumped in right away and just kind of recited case facts. So it's an hour and 20 minutes was each, each class discussion. And so the professor might say after the, the opening, uh, he might say, okay, was so well, how's this company doing financially? And it'd be like, all the hands are in the air, you know? Well, ex exhibit 15, you know, you can see what their earnings were. But it's like, to me, it's like, that's a case fact. I'm going to hang back and I'm going to wait till the very end. And so after, you know, the whiteboards are all filled with notes and everyone's thoroughly discussed what was going on in the case and kind of rehashing the, the details of the case. Then in every hands in the air competing for airtime, right? Because half your grade is class discussion. Half your grade is the final. <clears throat> and so then a professor, there'd be a pause and say, or she would say, okay, what would you do if you were the main protagonist in this case and you're trying to solve this problem uh, here on the board that we've laid out, what would you do? And that's when no hands were in the air. And that's when I would raise my hand and say, well, I'd do one, I'd do three things immediately. Boom, boom, boom. And uh, it was that style of case discussion that that really you know um, kind of set things apart in terms of the discussion. So I was in a study group, and one of the, my friends in the study group was from um, Nebraska. And the first day he goes, "Who here wants to be a Baker Scholar?" <laughs> you know, I want to be a Baker Scholar. And uh, he's looking around our little circle of our study group, and he goes, "Myers, what about you?" And I go, "You know, Dave, I just want to graduate. You know, I'm happy to be here, but um, and I'm, I want to network. I, I, I want to kind of enjoy this experience." So. You know, I don't want to put in the effort to be a Baker Scholar. And he was all disappointed. Well, I'm looking for someone that wants to, you know, kind of be at my level and, and work hard. And, and he's a great guy, became a great friend. But as it turned out with my additional life experience, not that I was any smarter than the average pair, but based on my life experience, based on having been a leader, based on all of my speech and communications training, I was a Baker Scholar. 
and uh it, and so it's kind of like especially my one of my roommates uh was just like you know i'm so disappointed you wade you never study uh you work in the afternoons or work out and then you all you do is flip through your cases in the morning so i'd get up an hour before class and just i'd have three classes of cases per day and just study for 20 minutes each and and go to class and i was just kind of blessed with the ability to sort of you know, listen to everything, take all it in, and then, you know, lay out a plan. Uh, so it was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed that. And I ended up at Boston Consulting Group, one of the, arguably the best strategy firm in the world, and uh, in Dallas, brand new office, is very entrepreneurial. And uh, so um, it was it was a great deal of fun to be there, had some great assignments. Oh, my goodness, just loved it. And uh, learned a bunch of lessons, including the combination of strategy, a better business proposition, capital leadership, et cetera. And so I'm gonna skip ahead to my entrepreneur phase. I left BCG after a couple of years. I had a, a backer in Minnesota. He was the older brother of one of my best friends at NDSU. And he said, uh, I'll, you know, you can join us as an entrepreneur in residence. I'll put up all the capital, I'll be the chairman of the board and I'll teach you how to be an entrepreneur. And uh, I get 80% and you get 20%. And I thought this is great. And so we started a bunch of companies together. We acquired companies. I learned a whole bunch of things as you can see there. This was my little apartment. He kept me on a, he said, I'll, I'll pay you, I'll pay you enough just to sort of eat and, and live while we're, you know, kind of figuring out what business to launch. So this is my little apartment in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, 450 square foot apartment. And this is my initial office where I'm, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, do it, trying to plan to plan something very sloppy, but I have my little fax machine and printer and so forth. And this is me after uh, starting my first company at my desk, same computer, uh, actually, uh, you know, kick things off as an entrepreneur. So here's some of my lessons learned as an entrepreneur. Wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from making mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes and therefore hopefully, you know, learn some wisdom. Um, this, this is one thing right away. It was very humbling because running a startup or a small business is way harder than a fortune 500 company. I never at mobile, I never worried about cash flow. you know, never had to worry about anything or, or budgeting boy in a, in a startup environment um, that there's, you know, your limited resources, high stress, it's way, way harder. And in fact, it's so hard that here's some analysis that I did for y'all out of every 666 startups, only one company makes it over 10 million in revenue. Only eight survive uh, after five years. So it's a it's a very difficult journey. I thought it would be easier. Um, it was very difficult. But thankfully, Tony Christensen out of Minnesota with Cherry Tree Ventures taught me how to be an entrepreneur. He was very patient with me. I learned a lot about rigorous analysis. <laughs> uh, it, uh, by or, As humans, according to Antonio Damasio and Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, we make decisions emotionally, not rationally. We resist deep analysis. Optimism as an entrepreneur introduces high risk. And the more emotional an event is, the less sensible people are. Daniel Kahneman's an amazing genius in terms of his, um, his field of work. But uh, I learned in spades that oftentimes I had to emotionally kind of jump into something, get really enthusiastic about a new product or um, a new customer. And, and uh, I, I learned to, to do rigorous analysis. So there's a couple of slides here that I'll just go through real quick and we'll do a Q&A. Uh, I learned the importance of repeatability. That is, you want to sell every customer exactly the same thing if you can. So you kind of, you know, um, if you're if you're offering a customized service or a custom product to every customer, you don't have the benefit of the experience curve. And so repeatability in your business model is really, really key. Ideally, you say exactly, you sell exactly the same thing to every customer as much as you can. Uh, and here's a couple of tips on how to maximize that and really standardize and productize everything you can and simplify customer choice. Way too many entrepreneurs try to, you know, serve everybody with everything and you can't do that. The size, the addressable market is really important. I learned that lesson on my very first deal where it was a, a small, very small addressable market and didn't really fully analyze it before I jumped into it. <clears throat> and so that's, that's a key lesson learned. The decision-making unit. But that very first startup had a very difficult decision-making unit. These are all the people that need to be involved to make a decision to buy your product or service. And it was a very complex DMU. It include, included like four or five people, the board, you know, donors, all kinds of stuff. And so a small decision-making unit, if you're selling one person and one decision-maker, that's way easier and faster to close than if you have to 
have several people, you know, weigh in and approve uh, buying that. And then, so here's some tips on shortening your sales cycle, um, you know, in terms of really, really qualify your prospect, learn how to na navigate that decision-making unit quickly and easily, break down your offering, disaggregate it, break it down into small bits, offer a free trial, do anything you can to, to get people started on your product or service. Uh, concept risk. One of my startups was way too new. It had new everything. It was a new offering, new style of delivery, new type, type of pricing, new relationships, and it introduced a lot of concept risk. And we had a very difficult go to market um, based on that and it didn't grow as nearly as much as we wanted to. So, in terms of minimizing that, you know, you can't be too far ahead of customers. It's good to be kind of just like, but better. It's not good to be so different that customers don't get it, right? And the same with delivery, how you deliver your product or service needs to engender trust and not doubt. And the uh, pricing needs to be under, easy to understand. And then e easy to quit too, easy to sign up, you know, easy to pay, easy to quit. And ideally look for network distribution, look for any kind of channel partnerships, anything that you're writing someone else's lever in leverage their existing relationships with the customer. Because trying to create a customer relationship from scratch is really, really difficult. Scalability is the ability to, as you grow, revenue, profitability increases. That's really critical. There's a couple of things on improving scalability and then um, focus on unmet needs. This is a, ideally there's a nagging problem that no one yet has solved and really understand those unmet needs. Talk to a lot of customers, do a lot of surveys, really understand what's going on. And, uh, and then in, in closing the perfect business, I'll just let you read this real quick. This is sort of my sort of statement of what an ideal business would look like as an investor. So obviously I have all these superlatives, right? Large, high growth market, et cetera. And, um, you know, capital efficient, <laughs> high gross margins. This is almost impossible uh, to achieve, but it's, a, it's aspirational to have a great business that is, you know, scalable, repeatable, um, you know, very few risks, et cetera. And this is the kind of thing that most VC investors will try to figure out in their diligence process of, you know, what does your product look like? What does your business model look like? What does your revenue model look like? And, uh, you know, how do you sell? How do you go to market, right? Do you have re referenceable customers? What's your sales cycle look like? And then finally, you know, the network effect or virality, and how do you, you know, do you have contractual recurring revenue better than, you know, non-contractual and one-time revenue, et cetera. So to make that simple, I've wrapped all of that into one easy application that is free. And if you want, you can just um, go through that. And a lot of questions from first-time entrepreneurs early on in the process is, how do I know if my idea is any good? What kind of questions do VCs ask? How do I prepare for, you know, the fundraising process? And this, this quick and simple app will help you by walking you through 50 diligence questions with objective scoring, which basically just helps you, you know, piece together um, and, and prepare for, for raising capital. And it's something after 30 years as an entrepreneur and investor that I uh, finally got around to putting together just, uh, you know, several months ago. So there, um, let's just take on some questions. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Wade, for that incredibly informative and inspiring presentation. We really do appreciate it. Um, it's amazing to see someone like yourself who came from modest beginnings in rural North Dakota here uh, go on to achieve like such success and the impact that you've had. Um, first question coming in here, though, is what is the biggest risk you have taken and did it pay off? Yeah, so uh, I made some mistakes. So during the Internet Build up. I raised seventy five million for one of the companies that I mentioned, and we were, um, you know, preparing to, for an IPO, and just really thought we had uh, the world by the by the tail. But what it, you know, the market um, kind of fell apart for internet startups. You know, the dot com bust, and uh, we did not return all of the capital as I mentioned. So it's kind of one of those painful experiences where you go, well, um, um, that was a pretty big risk. I, 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 I spun, I, you know, churned through a lot of investor capital and I never did, did that again. I, anytime I raise capital now, of course I have a venture fund now, so I'm an investor, uh, institutionally, but, um, the, uh, I kind of, I look back and I feel bad that I, 
kind of followed the herd. It's like, okay, you know, as long as there's no rules about profitability, it's all about eyeballs. And early days, the internet was kind of crazy. And uh, you just, you know, VCs just threw money at me and I took it and I spent it trying to hurry up and, you know, get really big. And uh, we did, we opened up offices all over the world and we, we got big, but we didn't, we didn't get profitable. <laughs> and so uh, we limped to profitability and sold it, but uh, it was uh, not a good experience. So uh, that's probably the biggest risk that I took. Uh, following that one up, we have, as a senior, how many years should I work professionally before applying to Ross for an MBA? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So one of the things that, you know, I spent seven years at Mobile Chemical selling a product I had no passion for. Don't do that, right? What I tell my college age kids is, you know, look for the biggest company you can work for with the best training program and learn the core skills. So it's almost like an extension of college, right? So uh, my son's a senior in marketing, for example, and I'm encouraging him to go work for a big company that has a great you know, marketing program and great training program. But then once he's been there for you know, a year or two, and he's kind of learned everything he can learn at that level, if he's not getting promoted, then leave and maybe take a sales position and learn everything you can about sales and just kind of build your skill set. And so that might, so in most cases, most MBA programs like students with at least two years of experience, preferably probably three or four. So I like the idea of at your third year of employment, applying for business school and then going after four years of employment in the fall. That would probably be my favorite. I was kind of Uncle Wade. I was sort of, I was, you know, a lot of times I didn't really feel like I felt it, uh, fit in too much, you know. <laughs> well, awesome. Um, that kind of answers the next question as well. So I think I'm going to pass it off to Lucky here for our wrap up here. Okay. Okay. Well, Wade, thank you. On behalf of the NDSU Center for Entrepreneurship and Family Business and the NDSU student body, thank you so much for sharing your time, knowledge, and expertise with us. It has been absolutely incredible to get insights from such an accomplished entrepreneur and ask questions for our own paths and our aspirations. So once again, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. And thank you. Oh, sorry, Wade. Uh, okay. And thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, please watch for your emails for the recording. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Go Bison. <laughs> Go Bison. All right. Thanks, guys.